All right. Um, so I am at the beginning of learning uh, our Markdown and GitHub, uh, as a matter of fact. And so because I'm at the beginning of learning our Markdown, that's why it says chapter three, chapter four. So chapter three of, I think, whatever I have downloaded into, into uh, my local repository, but today we're gonna cover chapter four of the book uh, about collective geomes, okay? So just a couple of general housekeeping items that, that I personally, I like to bring up. Um, it, one is that it's a learning opportunity. We can ask questions at any time. And an, in, I always like to encourage people to learn the theory and uh, behind whatever it is we're talking about. And this, the theory behind ggplot, at least one of them is the grammar of graphics. And so there's a, a paper by that name that you can look up and read. Encourage everybody to do the chapter exercises. It's the second best learning opportunity. And then please plan to facilitate one of the discussions because that is the best learning opportunity. Okay. So then some of the learning objectives for this, for, the, for our discussion today. Number one is to understand the, the difference between individual geomes and collective geomes. Number two is to explore some plots that have used individual and collective geomes together. And, um, and see the value that comes from doing from, from both of these together and then reinforce understanding of the grammar of graphics, particularly the use of layers to create plots. All right. So then um, I started off close to where we left off last week in particular related to that, uh, to the, um, the blog post that we had talked about. And then also following on with what Lydia presented last week in terms of the, in, the, uh, the individual geomes. So that was our last chapter and this is on collective geomes. And then, so in order to help with the intuition on this, this is a, a drastic oversimplification, but it may be useful. Uh, when we look at individual numbers, it's kind of the difference between individual numbers versus the sum of the numbers. So a sum converts a series of numbers or individuals into a single number or a collective. The same way that if we were to do this with home prices, it would be under individual geomes, each home price would have a point on the plot or the table. But under the collective geome idea, we may use something like median as a single number that summarizes all of the individuals. Okay. So straightforward, I think it's easy to understand, but maybe it helps a little bit with the intuition to think about it that way converting a, a bunch of numbers into a single number. Okay. So going back to that blog post that we looked at last week, um, this is, it goes a little bit more into the data or the, the code the coding side of it. Starts out with an individual, uh, an individual data set from MT cars, right? And then it becomes, then, then the author uses a, um, a, a grouped data set based off of that individual and then through some cleaning and some cleansing of it, ends up with this output here, which shows a individual, individual observations, which are all of these dots, and then a, a collective or a grouped observation, which is the bar plots that represents the average horsepower for all of those observations. Okay. So an, another part of that blog post that we talked about, um, talked about a longitudinal study. So it, did a, it looked at a separate data set and this is comes from the Our World in Data data set, and it talks about healthcare spending per country over time. The reason I wanted to include this one too is because it's, a, as I said, a longitudinal study, and the book example is also a longitudinal study. So looking at two longitudinal studies might, might help. Now, I had to look up what a longitudinal study was. You guys probably already know, but a longitudinal study is looking at the same subject and taking the same observation from subjects over a series of, of, of time, over a period of time, okay? Anybody wanna explain it differently? Does that make sense to everybody? So you have the same, in this case, uh, for, the, for the healthcare spending, the, the subject is going to be the country, and then you're gonna take the observation of healthcare spending in that country over time. I think another way, Ryan, to put longitudinal data uh, would be rise over run. 
So you're plotting, right? You're, you're coming up with the, like the mean value. Um, when, when you use the word longitudinal, I, am I confirming that with the team? Uh, or is there anybody else that may debate that comment? I always look at, at, at longitudinal data or there's a different term for it, but um, you're, you're plotting a, a, a uh, it, it is over time. Your time is the, is the uh, X axis. Yeah. So your Y is the variance, your, your, the, the height of each plotted point, And then the time would be the X axis, how long it, it strings out. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and so that's, you can see it kind of here in the raw data where you have Albania and there's an observation in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, and so on. Right. Um, so in, in this raw data, the ind individual observations are at the combined country year level. This is one observation distinguished from this one based off of the country and year combination. Okay. So for the purposes of plotting though, the individual geome will still just be the country and all the yearly observations for each country. Okay. So this was a little bit of, a, of just a mentality switch for me was that each of these each of these records, even though there's individual observations here at 2001, 2002, 2003, when we talk about the individual geome, it's actually the country is the individual. And then, so this line is one individual, this line is a second individual, this line is a third individual, even though it's a collection of, of individual, even though it's a collection of observations for the same subject over time. Anybody have any questions or want to try to explain it differently or better? Make sense? Okay. Cool. So then uh, the purpose of bringing up that longitudinal study was because once we get into this chapter in the book, um, we look at, at pretty much an, a longitudinal study called Oxboys. The data set is called Oxboys, and it shows the age and the corresponding height of 26 boys studying at Oxford, it's also a longitudinal study. And then I would just point out here that the age variable is standardized. So when you look at the age, you see like negative one, negative 0.7479, and so on down. And, and my assumption on this is that they probably, some, uh, some individuals may have been observed over the course of a year, maybe some over the course of three years and some over the course of five years. But in order to make all of those time periods universal, they standardized it and represented this way using um, using a negative number from negative one to roughly one. Okay. But, but when it gets to it, we're going to be looking at age and height. You can see that this was the first observation, the second observation over time, all for individual person number one. Okay. Right. So as the book says, in many situations, you want to separate your data into groups, but render them in the same way. In other words, you want to be able to distinguish individual subjects, but not identify them. Sometimes you want the individual geome to be a group of observations for the same individual. You do this by adding a group argument to the aesthetic. And maybe as a hint, if you're trying to figure out which variable to use as the grouping variable, fill in the blank. I have multiple observations for each blank or for longitudinal studies, I want to plot one line over time for each blank, okay? So then noting that, what would you say is the grouping variable for Oxboys? Let me cover this up because I think I did it wrong. So looking at the raw data, anybody want to eventually guess what the grouping variable would be for this? It's a multiple observations of height over the grouping variable of subject. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, so in the case of ox boys, we want to plot a line over time for each boy. So subject is the grouping variable in the aesthetic. Okay. So then we've included that here, that code here, and you can see where we've added in group equals subject. And the plot looks like this age on the bottom height on the y-axis, and then each line represents one of the 26 um, boys' subjects that was observed. Pretty straightforward. 
Um, the book makes mention of this, that if we incorrectly specify the grouping variable, it leads to a characteristic sawtooth appearance. Okay. So in this, in this uh, ggplot code, we have not included a grouping variable. And so there's a line between each of these observations in negative one, and then there's one line that connects it to the next group, and then a single line that connects it to the other group. So all of these dots are connected by one continuous line. It goes up and down here, and then there's one that shoots over and so on. Okay. The reason it looks like this is because, as it mentioned, we haven't included a good, a good grouping variable. Right. So then the next section in the book talks about different groups on different layers. Uh, I have a question, yes. sorry. So uh, on grouping, um, so I was looking at uh, an old code and you know, there it said uh, group equal to one. Um, so is there, uh, is there an example anyone else has seen and can talk about like, why would you do that? Because I, I'm, I'm still trying to look into it and figure that out. Yeah, I remember coming across that, but I didn't dive into it. So I, I know what you're talking about, but anybody else? I know what you're talking about, but I don't have an answer. Okay, Sometimes. if anybody else has maybe jump in as well, then we can look at it later. Yeah. Right, good. So then when we look at different groups on different layers, so the book says that sometimes we want to plot summaries that use different levels of aggregation. One layer might display individuals while another displays an overall summary. So now that we've plotted individual geomes, indi I should say individual geomes, let's add a collective geome, which is the trend line for all boys together. Okay, so this is what we've done so far. We now want to just get one line that talks about or looks at the growth over time for all of these. Okay. All right, so then we add in the code here, group, we all, oh, this is the code that we have grouped by subject. And then we just add on to the end a geome smooth and some of this other information, um, the method that we'll use and, and turn off the standard error bar, okay? And so what we end up with is this, okay? Now this isn't exactly what we wanted. Each line now has its own, its own blue line. So each of the individuals now has its own. And we wanted just one blue line that summarized, summarized all of them, okay? So we were expecting a, we were expecting a collective geome, but we got individual oh. geomes again. And then from the book, it says grouping controls Grouping controls both the display of the geomes and the operation of the stats. One statistical transformation is run for each group. So the reason that we got multiple geomes was because we had the grouping variable in the ggplot line or ggplot layer. So the grouping flows down to all layers of the plot. What we need to do is uncouple the, un, uh, uncouple the grouping variable at the ggplot layer and add it where we want in the grouping namely at the geome line layer, okay? So here's the, here's the final result on that one. So remember we had group equals subject up here in this layer. And one of the rules about ggplot is that anything, any aesthetics that you put from the ggplot layer will automatically flow down to all of the other layers as well, okay? So because we had group equals subject up in the ggplot, then geome line took on that aspect, geome point technically, I guess, took on that aspect, but it, it didn't matter because they were individual points. But then the geome smooth also took on that aspect. So we, we had an implicit grouping under geome smooth, um, grouping at the subject level, which was why we got all of these multiple lines when really we just wanted one. So by taking the grouping out of the ggplot line and adding it only to the layer that we want, which was geome underscore line, then we still see the grouping for the geome line, but the geome smooth uses the full data set to create that smooth. There's no, there's no grouping that it inherits from the ggplot layer. Okay. Any questions or comments? 
Ja, well, 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 uh, well portrayed, I don't know, <laughs> well said. Right. So this sort of starts to hint at the idea of overriding the default grouping. Okay. So in the last exercise, we finally got the grouping right. And um, by adding the grouping to geome line, we overrode the default grouping, which was no special grouping. Okay. So here's another example to help illustrate this point a little bit better. And it comes from a different blog post and the, the link is there. Um, and then for this one, subtitles are added to these to describe what's going on. All right, so this goes back to the MPG data set. Um, and let's see. So for this one, we it does a, it uses the the drive, four wheel drive, um, front wheel drive, and rear wheel drive by the different values for that. On, that's on the x axis. On the y axis is the highway mileage. So by by breaking it up into by including this grouping of DRV and highway, um, then it knows to automatically create a box plot for each value of a drive. Okay. No big deal. Okay. But then let's say that we want to also uh, break out and, and assign a color to each of these values, each of these dots, based off of the year. So we'll have there's two years, two two years of value uh, in this uh, in this data set. So let's say we wanted some of these to be representative of one year and the other ones to be representative of a different year, but still to use the box plot for the whole entire grouping. Okay. <clears throat> so if we were to just add in this part that says to um, to assign the color based off of the year. This creates a, a, um, a, a grouping as well. And so now you can see that because that's in there, it, it does an individual box plot for each year as well. Okay. So it kind of implicitly interpreted that we needed or that we wanted different box plots for each year for each drive value. We, we may not want this, <clears throat> okay. But it, it makes the point that that when you put a uh, any kind of grouping or any kind of aesthetic mapping into the GG plot layer, it could very well find its way down into some of the future layers as well, which you might not want. Okay, but you can always override that as well by adding a different grouping call into the layer that it needs to be. So even though we've got color equals factor equals factor year here. And we're seeing that show up on all of these all these dots. We can still add a grouping into the box plot layer, grouping based off of the original values that we wanted under drive. And now we have back that single box plot for each value, while the individual observations take on this this coloring that we specify up here. Okay. So this was this is just a lesson in a section on overriding uh, overriding the the groupings that take place. Okay. Hopefully pretty straightforward. And then coming to the end here, actually, um, there's just a couple of exercises. So this uses the MPG data set again. And you can see here what that looks like. And then the exercise says to draw a block, draw a box plot of highway for each value of cylinder without turning cylinder into a factor. What extra aesthetic do you need to set? Okay. So this is wrong. This is how, it, how you might uh, try to do, to do it first using um, assigning the cylinder to the x-axis, highway to the y-axis, and then just putting on a geom box on there. So this generates the, the incorrect result where it has one box plot for all of the values. You get a warning here that says continuous X aesthetic. Did you forget aesthetic group? Did you forget to set a grouping? Well, yes, we did. That was the point of the question. And so then when we go back, we can add in a group here, a grouping based off of cylinder. And then now you can see that each of the cylinder values gets its own box plot. Okay. Make sense? Good questions. 
there's no questions that I have a question because the warning that I get here says continuous X aesthetic. But what I have in the X aesthetic is the cylinder. And if I look at the raw data, the cylinder is an integer data type. And so then does that mean that it's interpreting this cylinder as a continuous? I think that integers are actually discrete. E, that's a good question. That's how I interpreted this um, when I did this exercise as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's research, an interesting. I, yeah, I, online it says that integers are discrete. So I would have expected it to just discreetly uh, create a box plot for five, six, and seven here and not give me this warning about X being a continuous aesthetic, but it did. Um, sorry, question. What, what's the question again, Ryan? Um, the question is that, that I had here on the X axis, I had the cylinder. Uh -huh. And cylinder here is an integer in the raw data. It's an integer right. data. And right. so by putting the cylinder down here, um, I get this warning that says that there's a continuous X aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So it surprised me that an integer was giving a, me a warning about a continuous X aesthetic. Right. So I think the reason could be, and I think it mentions as well, that it's not a factor. So uh, effectively what it is doing is... Uh, so since it is not a factor, it is not giving you three different uh, at five, six, and seven. Uh, integer is still a continuous number after all, right? Like you don't have fractions, right? So it's not a, what is that other thing called double? It's not a, in, it's not a, uh, what's that word? What's the other double. data type that you have? Yeah, it's not a double or it's not the, number which has fractions, integer does not have fractions, but it still is a continuous number. So an age, five, six, seven, 10, 30, 100, it's, it's a continuous number, right? Like uh, one can have any age, like any integer value can be age as long as it's positive, right? So I think that's what this warning means. Because if, let's say, um, you know, when you're using this cylinder variable, if you did as dot factor there, Mm -hmm. then you would see three different um, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and that's what I ended up doing for this as well um, and then I I didn't go as far as you did Ryan with like wondering well why is it it's an integer it's not technically continuous but I just looked at somebody brought up this issue on GitHub um, this was like in 2015 it looks like Hadley and like some of their contributors closed it. So it looks like this answer was sufficient, but the um, contributor said that um, because in most cases the integer values past the ggplot actually do represent continuous values. So the, the integer values are granular, but in most cases they belong on a continuous scale. So I guess that yeah. makes sense. Like by default, like, you know, how would we think of integers? Most of them, we would think of them as a, on a continuous scale. Yeah. Um, right. Even though it's not a double, right? It's not like any number with fraction or, you know, any uh, floating point number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe speaking broadly, because some of the research that I did said that an integer was discrete, but maybe that's just more in like a broad sense. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, no. it's, I mean, I'm sure we could find the line in like one of the GG plot functions that like, I, honestly, there's probably so many like different methods. I'm not sure how we would find it, but um, but it seems like yeah, if it if you can think of it on a continuous scale, then it would be mapped as a a continuous variable. Right, because see, for example, if you would see sales, right, sales of an item, like and especially let's say big items like a refrigerator or a um, dishwasher, right? These items or these items would be per piece. But sales is obviously like I think that in, in, in our head we can imagine that sales is a numeric number. It, it's numeric or it's like it's a continuous number, right? Yeah. Um, but in for example, in these cases, uh, sales of all, I mean, not just food, like even a small thing like a food item, it will be an act, 
complete number it will not be 3.2 right yeah. that's why i mean and that's how i think that uh, for me it's like obviously it's a it's a, con, a continuous number kind of a statement i'm going to pass yeah um yeah so it's it's a continuous number without decimals <laughs> exactly exactly continuous, yeah <laughs> Um, the last, uh, the last exercise here was pretty similar to the same one. This one, um, yeah, down here. So this one asked us to modify the following plot so that you get one box plot per integer value of displacement, right? So this is how it was given to us. Same sort of thing, continuous X aesthetic. Um, and then, so if we go back up here to the displacement, the displacement is an, is an actual double. And so you do actually have fractional portions of the and the displacement value and it's asking us to to plot it so that you get one box plot per integer value of displacement and there's probably multiple ways of doing this the my approach was to use the the ceiling function which rounds everything up to the next highest integer and so i i added this grouping in at the at the displacement level um and then now you've got the integers and it, and it just and it uh, displayed it that way, um, but somehow with my approach, it made it so that the box plot didn't line up with the values on the x-axis. So you can see like this one hangs out over here to the left of the two. This one hangs out to the left of the three, and so on. So um, I don't know if that was because if that's because of the particular function I used or why it is, but. Um, Yes, if this was a real life example, I would just put this in the Slack and let somebody else solve the problem for me. Yeah, and on this, I have another question. So that the the one for the the bar for the two, it's thinner than the rest of them. Um, which so one? The second one. The second one by group where you uh -huh. are ceiling displacement. So displacement yeah. equal to two. This plot, uh, this uh, box plot is thinner while all others are. Much thicker and probably equally. I don't know. Maybe oh, not think... actually. The the one on the the one hanging on the left of five is also in between, but then three four seem like much wider. Oh right, yeah. I see. So what you're I saying. think I I think because you've you've mapped like two different variables to two different aesthetics, like you've mapped like the original displacement to uh -huh. the x-axis, and then you've mapped the the ceiling, so like the rounded very values to the group aesthetic. Yeah, um, absolutely right. So let me bring this There you up. go, who needs a Slack channel when you've got it live, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't get it. Can you repeat what, that, what, what does that mean? So like, I think because you've mapped basic, essentially like two different variables, like you want them both to be the same. You wanna map the same variable um, to the oh, x-axis so and the same variable to the group. So you're saying that other one should be ceiling? Like x also should be ceiling of yeah, displacement yeah. instead of displacement? Okay. Yeah, well, maybe. I guess we'll see what it looks like. Okay. There you go. Problem That's problem. it. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we don't need the slang. Yeah. <laughs> Except well, for the zoom link. <laughs> it's so interesting, but it does bring up, a, like, I guess some intuition that I need to gain is um, you know, a lot of times, and especially with other uh, tools that I've used, Tableau is what I think about. You just kind of drag the, the you would just drag a displacement over into like the column or the row shelf where you want it. And then it does all of this by itself. Like it, it makes the, it, it understands that you want ceiling displacement here and ceiling displacement here, you know, so it's automatic. But when you get into ddplot and you're actually writing the code, just as you said, you do need to make a determination that you you're you're just you're mapping displacement, the fractional value here, but then you're you're creating a different value under the grouping. So just an extra level of thought, I think, that has to go into it. It's not gonna it's not gonna do it automatically for you. Thanks, Dan. That was a good observation. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, that was good. I mean, I totally did that question wrong anyway. I didn't even read the uh, <laughs> per integer value. I was just like, oh, this is cool. I just... But no, that was good. Uh, uh, Ryan, you want to repeat what you said? Like, what was the learning in that sense? I think you were saying, like, summarized. 
version of that? Uh, um, repeat it. You wanted me to, to say what again? So I think the summarized version of what you said, like, you know, something we should be thoughtful of when you're saying the difference between the displacement and ceiling. Yeah. The grouping variable. So you just want me to repeat or say that again? Yeah, no, I understand. I, I understood the, like what was the solution, but I'm saying, um, what were you saying in the sense that what was your final takeaway yeah. from this? Yeah. Just I, sort of your thoughts if you could uh, yeah. summarize that. Yeah, my 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 thinking on it was so there's other there's other visualization tools and the one I'm most familiar with is Tableau, and in Tableau it's there's a um, a user interface there which does a lot of the thinking for you. So you you know in Tableau you you would have a list of all the variables, displacement being one of them, and with the user interface you would just easily drag you know the displacement variable over to the x-axis and drop it in. And, and you wouldn't think anything of it. You wouldn't ever think to go back and turn it into an integer um, or think that you need to turn it into an integer in both places, like add a special grouping and make sure that they're both, that they are both treated with this, with this ceiling uh, function. And so it's just a point that when you're actually writing the code as we are here in ggplot, oh, okay. you, have to, you have to conscientiously remember that uh -huh. you've made a grouping over here, but you also have to go back in and make a grouping over here because, because mapping to the X value here is different than mapping to the grouping to the grouping here. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I think, maybe a, a pitfall I know that I would fall into pretty easily. Well, obviously, I did fall into it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I, I've done these things to myself, and I could not figure this out myself. Like, why was those? Why were those bits different? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, as as a wise man said at the beginning of this call, with much power, coding comes much responsibility. Making sure that you don't mess it up. So, uh, so <laughs> right. it's no, but out. then you know this thing even falls uh, is is sort of true for even when you're using Tableau, right? Because a lot of things that you said it it would think for you. But if you don't know what it is thinking for on your behalf, yeah. you know, you, you've got to know it like what's under the hood. So yeah. even in that case, you have to be that conscious because I, I've loved uh, Tableau uh, too. I've used it for a long time. Uh, not, I don't use it anymore. But yeah, I, I, in fact, I was thinking when you were saying, so I think one of those things that not having to group it and all those things might actually sometime maybe cause problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So same same way you know it did here. Um, so sometimes the the tool the UI can take care of it, but maybe not all the time. And things uh, you know in your final presentation it looks like oh something is off. I didn't notice this before, and then you're like okay let's go back and look at the drawing board. So okay. Yeah. Nice. And then they, yeah, then they say well why don't you yeah they say why don't you just use Tableau? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right, I'll let you continue. Yeah, so that concludes what I had prepared. Um, in truth, there was another section here called matching aesthetics to graphic objects, and it, it went over my head. So maybe if somebody else wants to take this next week, or, or maybe this is enough for everybody, and we can just move on to, um, to chapter five. Um, it doesn't matter, but uh, I, anyway, so, or just take this on your own, um, this section about matching aesthetics to graphic objects. I, uh, I didn't get to it. So, so then I was, I was kind of hoping we would we would cover that because I, I it went a little bit over my head. But then I was like, I don't need to understand every detail in this book per se, and like I don't know if I would ever use this, and if I ever needed to, I'm sure I could just revisit. But, um, and I guess like going back to one of the the first exercise. Sorry, I can't remember if you mentioned this or not. Um, but like one thing I guess that I thought that was interesting is when you, um, so when you map like the cylinder, uh, the number of cylinders, so when you plot like number of cylinders on the X and highway MPG on the Y, um, and then group by the number of cylinders, when it treats the number of cylinders as a continuous object, I, I, I'm guessing it interpolates then, it like treats it kind of as a range 
because when I looked like, I guess the difference between the two plots is there's, there's actually no seven cylinder car or seven cylinder vehicle, but it, it interpolates that as like a range, like from four to eight. And then there's just nothing in the seven um, category, yeah. like the seven tick for X. I don't know if anybody else thought that was interesting or not, but I guess, yeah. Cause like there's a, maybe you could think about that as like just setting the grouping argument as a way over, like around um, sort of like just a single box plot for number of cylinders, but in a way it's kind of misleading because there's actually no data for, for that particular value. Yeah. Um, that's a great observation I hadn't picked up on too. So, and I, yeah, I don't know, maybe like next week or somebody in the Slack will figure this out, but I wonder if there's a way that you can um, like, somehow like after it interpolates the range like specifier like drop all that aren't actually in the data but at oh, that point sure. it seems like you might as well just use it as a factor and, and save yourself more lines of code yeah Let's see if it does it here no you keep it yeah because then I, I looked actually because i was like oh this is weird there's not even like a point or anything and sure enough when i grouped by the number of cylinders and then ran summarize it. There's no vehicles that have seven cylinders. Well, that's an interesting observation. I, I didn't see that myself, but I think it, it's something we must uh, maybe poke around and continue yeah. to have conversation on Slack. I mean, I definitely would look it up tonight and see, uh, you know, maybe what else goes on in the GitHub repo. Maybe there's something about it. But, but yeah, I mean, from uh, from when we use this, I mean, it's it's technically not probably the right way to use it, but we we must know what exactly is happening. Again, you know, like knowing what goes under the hood. If you are using a, a, a you know a box plot presentation for doing some uh, you know, generating some insights, you should know uh, what numbers it is showing. And yeah. if it's not in the data, that's like, oh, what's yeah, going exactly. On? I think, it, yeah, that was like kind of my biggest takeaway is like, oh, maybe this is interesting because I didn't know this before I you know, like started this book club. Um, yeah. Stan, would you be interested in putting it in the Slack just so that somebody does? Oh, sure. Yeah. Write a note to myself to do that. I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to see what the reason is on that. Because I'm sure I would go right into the presentation and people would ask me, why is there a seven? And I have no idea. Yeah. And honestly, like, I, it's like, if I have this question, I'm sure that somebody has brought this up as an issue on GitHub. And I'm sure that, yeah. like, one of those maintainers has figured it out. Yeah. Okay. Or All it right. might be that something is mm -hmm. wrong and then we can, you know, raise, raise an L. What is that called? Mm -hmm. Issue? We can we could raise a pull request and get this thing and get that people get the maintainers to work on this. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's what I had then um, for the, for the group here. Pranky, do you want to take it back over? Um, um. So I I just wanted to see if we wanted to talk about the GitHub thing. Ryan, uh, you and Ryan M had mentioned that in the chat or uh, in the Slack. So. Again, I'm not too good with Bookdown myself, so it's not, I mean, I, it's not a topic that I can lead. Yeah. But if someone wants to go through it, who has experience, uh, I'd be happy to hear to live in, sit in and hear. Yeah, I thought there might be two things to cover. One having to do with the format, the, the Bookdown format here. And if there's a preference as to which level do we put different things at and uh, or where to keep the general housekeeping items and then just for me I don't know whenever I click on introduction here it goes blank so I, I'm probably doing something wrong here um, so that was that was one well and then as well with that uh, you know when I do what I put up here in the YAML is iOS slides presentation but then when I knit it it comes out as a as in the book down format and i was just noticing today that i've got here um somewhere in here in the in the files 
it does it as like um, to tmwr.rmd. It's almost, I think there might be some other kind of output file that it's generating. Um, let's see if I can generate it again real quick because I remember what I did. I had an error like this. So anyway. Yeah, template from other book clubs. TMWRs dot tiny modeling with R. Yeah. So what yeah. You, can, yeah, would anybody mind explaining what how it works? Ron, do you want to take care of that or I can I may be able to answer one of the questions real quick. Um, so Ryan, if you could scroll to the top of your page and let's look at that uh, first initial call. So the output type, uh, I think iOS slides presentation, is that a uh, is that one of the YAML calls for book down or knitting? That could be one of the the attributing it, it, facts. Yeah. Well, it's it's supposed to be just like a presentation, something similar to like a PowerPoint right. layout so rather your, than book down format. So right now your 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 tab, your your saved file is chapter four, uh, collective geomes. So that should be your title. Uh, it's not necessarily that they they are not associated together it's just keeping with uh, the same uh, thought process the saved file and your uh, r markdown uh should be the title within your your uh, uh yaml call okay so chapter and then, the geomes so the the second thing that could be affecting this so uh in line 15 in line 15, you've got the pound sign or hashtag, and then it says chapter four, collective geomes. In book down or in R markdown, the single hashtag is heading level one. So the, the system is automatically going to put a numeric value there. You don't have to control that. So uh, what I initially think about when it said chapter three, but then it says, uh, you know, chapter four, uh, yeah, where you've got it as chapter three, that's actually not even anything that you're in control of. That's part of the compiler uh, or the knitting process that puts that in front. And then you're calling it as a user, chapter four, collective geomes. You don't need that chapter four in there. Uh, you can wipe so that out. Is, is that because uh, the first chapter that I'm supposed to uh, push to the GitHub, I have not done that yet, but it's still uh, the introduction though. Possibly, right. So it's just a numeric sequence, right? So the file name is 04 collective geomes. So the file name as part of the table of contents uh, would, would imply that there's Ryan's working on the fourth chapter. That means okay. that there should be four, or sorry, three previous files. So the compiler of- All right, so it uh, must be that automatic- uh, That's like, probably uh, doing it, yeah. Link, what is it called, uh, the ordered list? So it automatically just goes one, Correct. two, three, four. Correct. Um, yeah. Yes, and that's it's looking at that hashtag is is actually what's doing that. Uh, so oh, okay. uh, our yeah, markdown. We had last week's uh, file from Lydia is also missing, so that probably yeah. that that would be third, yeah. and then this would be fourth. Okay. Yep. Because so actually, you... on the yeah, yeah, I was yeah. going to say on on the GitHub, um, Ryan's chapter two isn't up yet either. So like, yeah, when I, I was kind of testing it out and knitting it as well, um, using the book down and it ended up, mine ended up being like chapter two. So I think we have to like load them up in like a sequence. Like you would have to load chapter two, then I load chapter three and then the chapter four, because yeah, like I noticed so we, that when I was trying, like practicing knitting. Great statement. No, great statement. So if we look at Priyanka as being the moderator of that GitHub repo, Priyanka, I don't know if you're able to commit directly to that repository. I would assume that you're making a pull request and then John would accept it mm -hmm. into the into the larger yeah. Uh, yeah. collective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So each team member, Ryan, uh, Stan, myself, uh, Lydia, we are all forks of that same repository. So yep. we, if, if you were following the correct protocols and nobody ever does, so don't feel that I'm, I'm judging anybody for this case, you would always want to mirror your forked copy off of the uh, primary. So it's like- Oh, I think I get what you're saying. Okay. So you're pulling, you're pulling down the updates 
Uh, and I, I think I'm using the word pull in the wrong context there. Yeah, but you're right. bringing so every down. Time, sorry, sorry, I'm interrupting, but just for my okay. clarification, I think. Yep. So I think it, what what has what has to happen is that every time you want to push, everyone every time you want to commit your changes to the code, you want to first. You know, make sure you check out everything on your local. So whatever is there on the main actual repo, you update your fork with it, and then you yes. make your changes, and then you commit to it. You're, what, what that commit you're doing, though, Piranka, is just sending it to your local forked copy. Then you, re, uh, that's why I'm saying the word pull request is kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's a reverse of what you're actually doing. Uh, mm -hmm. You're requesting for the moderator or the owner of that repository to pull or accept your changes into the global context. So mm -hmm. the word pull request is actually reversed. It's, it's you're requesting for the moderator to pull your comments in. The, you're only manipulating your local copy. And so if the repository is out of, out of uh, hasn't accepted these pulls, you're updating your content into that, uh, uh, sorry, you're, mirroring your forked copy to the global repository and then your local machine your computer is pulling from that cloud get repository to update your local machine so you've got this kind of cascading uh, uh, hierarchy uh, that's occurring and each person and this is the whole why git is such a powerful tool is that it doesn't really matter who's coming at the object the repository is a repository and you can't ever really touch it unless somebody grant you that direct uh, ability. Um, Ryan, do you want to go to the uh, get your own forked copy of the GitHub repo, uh, the website itself? If you don't want to, I can more than happy to share screens and show you what I was gonna do. Uh, why don't you do it because I'm on the- Okay. Yeah, why don't you do it? Um, That's okay. But, but let me ask a question about that. So let's say that you know two weeks ago, <clears throat> I, had, I had uploaded version two or chapter mm -hmm. two, the, the previous presentation. And then in the meantime, somebody found an error with it and they made a change to it. And then I'm now about to do number four. And so then I download everything and, and then I make a change to two. So now there's the other person's change to two and my person and my change to two. Well, there, there I think there'd be a merge conflict. And okay. uh, well, if they're two different, <laughs> if they're two different changes, then that's fine. But if they're, if you're trying to change the same thing that same would one. fundamentally not, you know, be compatible to mesh, then the moderator would have to merge those conflicts somehow. What, what Stan's referring to is the is the lines of text, right? So you're modifying different lines of text. The in a large team, the likelihood of of merge conflicts are pretty high. If it's just you know the the seven or eight of us in the book club, and we're all uh, working with our own forked copies, and then we we request a pull uh, and says, okay, now I've got a collision between the same line of the same file file yeah. name, then what Stan's referring to is that that moderator, John, would have to accept who is the more appropriate. The best way to get around that as a user within Git is create your own branch within your own repository. And so what branching is doing is just like a tree. You're branching off these other uh, uh, points. Uh, there was a conversation that Frederica had in a previous book club where she wasn't quite grasping the concepts of branching and she had like you know, a hundred different branches. There's actually a school of thought that says once your merge request is, is accepted, your pull request is accepted, you delete that branch. There's two schools of thoughts to that. And, and I can give you both uh, ideas behind which is good or bad, but at the end of the day, it's up to a personal user. Do I want to hoard every single thing that I've ever done from the history of time? Uh, or am I only, uh, uh, worried about the most up-to-date versions. It's kind of like uh, the same question would be, do you delete your emails when they come into your inbox or you just let them collect and, you know, rat hole them for, you know, years on end? It's kind of a personal choice. Um, it, it may be a, <clears throat> maybe a topic to bring up in, in, in the future only because we're down to five minutes left and I wanted Great. to let, to let uh, Priyanka <clears throat> have any time if she wanted to. You bet. No, no, it's okay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you can do the formal closing too if you want. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, um, I, I don't know if there's a presenter scheduled for next week as well. Um, no, so we did chapter four right now, right? We, next is uh, maps, I guess, um, which Ryan five. wanted to take. Chapter five shows the statistical summaries. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't think any we have anyone for this. Uh, and again, maybe do that call out. If not, maybe I can take it. Maps, I guess, is Ryan M. And then Michael messaged me about annotations. So we would have networks chapter open. Okay. If anyone wants to take that. Yeah, and feel free to take even the statistical summaries if you want. If anybody is interested. When it talks about statistical summaries, is that, is it this stat? Is this a whole chapter over stat equals identity equals whatever? Kind of, yeah. I only ask because it doesn't actually mention statistical summaries until 5.6. So I, I don't know the content here. Oh, yeah, so I've not finished reading it, but yeah. I, I guess I want to say yes, so I'm not 100% sure though. For the sake of brevity, would it be appropriate, Priyanka, do you, uh, do you want me to do chapters five and six? I won't have any qualms with, with presentation at all uh, okay. on, on any of those weeks. And okay, given okay. the fact that it's spanning, well, given the spec, uh, fact that it's spanning two weeks worth of time um, covering both topics, I might be able to squeeze in a quick brief Git uh, exchange as well. Sure, okay. sounds good. Okay. Brian, I might mention that I came across a, uh, a, a blog post by June, who's on our call right now, that talked about statistical summaries that helped, helped me a lot too, so. Um, out for, for that blog post. Hi. So we good for now? Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your, your input and your participation to make this as successful as it is. Yeah, it was a good discussion, especially with, with yeah. Git. Um, I'll probably forget a lot of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So do, I guess like if anybody has to head off, they can obviously, but like, does anybody use like their own, like I have my own um, GitHub repo that I push to that I have like my R projects in and everything. And so like would, I'm assuming that I would have to pull, basically create another local repository of the forked version of this, you know, master, um, book club copy, but keep my own. Does that sound I think like that's so. kind of the right idea? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was... Ryan did here with the pull request. You have an open pull request that John made a comment on, and you haven't addressed it yet, so he hasn't merged it in. So if you uh, address those and make your changes, I think he'll merge it in, and then the numbers will line up. There's an upstream fetch that you can do from the from the page. Uh, Joan, I think the uh, there's a, uh, a GitHub uh, toolbox. I think uh, there's another layer beyond Git that GitHub has that you can do uh, some additional uh, uh, merge requests, pull requests, things outside of the context. I haven't used those tools yet. Right. Are you familiar with what I'm referring nope. to? Okay, never mind. <laughs> I do my base six and that's it. Agreed. Um, whenever someone does the merging, I attempted to add my name to chapter three, like the presenters list. I wasn't sure if I did it right, so it still hasn't, it's not on the GitHub yet, but yeah. Does, does it show, Lydia, does it show a, uh, a pull request on the master repo? Uh, so if you're on your GitHub page, the, the you may have, be viewing your forked version. Just oh, below that, there should be a subheading that subheading will take you to the master repo. In that master repo that John is, is uh, orchestrating, you can go to pull request, which I think is your second option, maybe the third option across the top, 
header of the web page, go to pull request. If it doesn't show anything of Lydia uh, requesting that change, then it hasn't actually made it to John's level yet. All right. Yeah, Lydia, it's there. John hasn't just reviewed it. Okay, good. Oh, okay, okay. All right, I think we're good. And then, um, go ahead, so, Lydia. oh, sorry. Also, so does it matter like um, the order? Cause yeah, I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around like the concept of um, GitHub. So like, will it matter the order in which like Ryan and I upload our chapters? Cause he's chapter two and four. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it shouldn't at all, no. Uh, because they're, they're separate topics, right? They're separate files. You would mm -hmm. be working in yeah. two different locations uh, two different mm -hmm. uh, two different settings. Oh, okay. How, how does it know that chapter two, then chapter three, and then chapter four? That's or the actual numbering. file name itself. What yeah, the, the file numbering. Mm. So um, there's a pretty simple example on the practical statistics for data scientists. It's uh, literally named 01.rnd, 02.rnd, and then it'll just take care of itself in the background. Um, is it, is it just, is it just sorting off of alphabetically essentially? I think so. So if we didn't file, make that, then it would, it, it would, there would be no order. So if you actually look at the R&Ds, they don't actually have any chapter one or anything. They're just headings. Okay. Yeah, I was going yeah, to, I, I was going to add, I was going to add to Joanne's comment. It doesn't, so it's not technically important that you put 010203 that like the, the the semantics of your file naming structure isn't really relevant right because the system is going to take care of that for you if it's alphabetical if it's numerical whatever the course may be for a human being and our own sanity it would be implied that putting a 010203 for us would mean that it, it it's easier for us to structure uh, the file naming uh, convention that we would view on GitHub, view on our local copy, and then view in the table of contents. But in essence, the table of contents doesn't really care. You can control what gets put in what order as you do your book down compiling. And that's a, it's a function of Pandoc, but Pandoc is an undertone of the R markdown uh, or book down uh, language. So uh, there was a comment from one of our users. I don't think it's in this book club. Uh, I think it was uh, Stan from our Mastering Shiny. He was having a, a comment about uh, the uh, uh, Pandoc error. Uh, and that just happens to be the version of R that he was using. Um, he's just got to do an R studio update and it should accept everything. That's a different topic. Okay. I think we're good, right? Anyone else? Okay. I'll catch up next week. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, that's good. Bye.